So this lecture goes along with chapter nine on cell communication. And the first slide is just saying, gee, if you were at this crowd, how could you communicate with your friends close by? How could you communicate with friends that might be far away? Here are three questions to see where you are on cell communication. Question one, cell communication occurs in multicellular organisms, but is not found in single cell organisms. That's a false statement. The origin of cell communication is in single cell organisms, and yeast cells communicate with one another. Here they're mating after communication. Bacteria communicate with one another. Question two. Endocrine set signals are transmitted more slowly than paracrine signals because the ligands And the answer is travel farther. The endocrine system puts the signal into the blood and it can go all over. Paracrine signals are cells that are close to one another. Question three, choose the correct path which shows how cells communicate. Okay, and the answer is C. There's some sort of signal, there's a receptor, and then there is the cell response. Okay, here's a nice video by the Amoeba Sisters you can watch. Here's another good video. It's 14 minutes. Don't watch it all. Just watch five minutes or so. It's very detailed, but it will give you some ideas. Intercellular signaling. Mostly, mostly we'll discuss how cells communicate between one another, but there's also intracellular signaling. So we'll also talk a little bit how messages are passed within a cell and amplified. All right, so four kinds of intercellular signaling, and then we'll give you examples of each. Autocrine signaling. A cell sends out a signal, and it's received by itself. Kind of odd. Uh, gap junctions. Two cells have a junction that connects the plasma membranes. And so they're very fast signals that travel between the cells. Paracrine, when cells signal to nearby cells. And endocrine. So when um, hormones are putting the bloodstream and they circulate to find the target cells. All right, and this goes through those four kinds of signals. Let's give you examples of each. Uh, so signaling molecules are sometimes called ligands. So instead of saying it's a hormone, instead of saying it's a neurotransmitter, a more general word is, to, is it's a ligand. Instead of saying it's an uh, an antigen from a virus. It's a ligand. It's something that's going to bind to a receptor. And ligands exert their effects by binding to a protein, and that protein is a receptor. Uh, usually they're on cell membranes, but sometimes not. Okay, so here's a, an example of a paracrine signal. So paracrine is nearby cells. So if you uh, Put your hand in the water to see if it's warm. A signal goes up your hand and it goes up a nerve cell on an electrical current. And then it has to skip a little gap to get to the next nerve cell. And that gap is called a synapse. And so vesicles in the neuron contain chemical signals. And through exocytosis, they let those chemical signals go out and the next cell is nearby, and, it, and if it's the right kind of neuron, it receives those signals, and then it will send that message up to your brain, and your brain will say, oh, the water's too warm, I better take my hand away, and that happens very quickly. They're designed for, neurons are designed for very quick travel. Now, the um, neurotransmitters, such as acetylcholine, that don't get taken up are reabsorbed or break down, 
And because the ligands are quickly broken down or removed, they can't travel very far. Okay, so that's paracrine sigmoid. So the receptors aren't always bound to the plasma membrane. Sometimes if you have a lipid like testosterone or estrogen, they can go right through the phospholipid bilayer. And so then there's an intracellular receptor that binds that testosterone or estrogen. They can move across the nuclear membrane and that receptor ligand are bound to the DNA to turn on genes. Uh, some receptors we'll see on the cell surface on the plasma membrane are ion channels, G proteins, and enzyme-linked receptors. So here's an ion channel. Here's a signal, signaling molecule. Here's an ion channel embedded in the plasma membrane. And when the signaling molecule, the ligand binds, it opens up that channel, and then ions can flow in and out. An example of something that opens an ion channel is nicotine. So if you're a smoker or you've ever seen somebody smoke, the nicotine binds to an ion channel and it opens it up. And you can play that little video and it will show you how it exerts its effects. G proteins are very common. So instead of having ATP attached, it has GTP attached. And so again, you have the G protein coupled receptor in the plasma membrane. You have a signal molecule that binds to it. An example of a molecule that could bind to it could be adrenaline. And then it alters the G protein. It goes from GDP and is replaced by GTP. You can think of that as being equivalent to ADP and ATP. And when it's replaced by GTP, the subunits move away and then they trigger a cellular response. And then it goes back to the original form. Click on the uh, link and you'll see how a G protein is triggered by adrenaline and causes glucose to be released for quick energy. Uh, a disease called cholera uh, that we don't hear about too much anymore is caused by an alteration in the G protein that's caused by bacteria. The notice from the subway is completely wrong. They had no understanding of what cholera does or, or how cholera causes the problems it does. But today we know that the bacteria creates a toxin and it binds to a G protein. And that keeps a chloride ion channel open in the cells lining the small intestine. When chloride ions flow out of the small intestine, water follows, causing diarrhea. Right, here's a plasma membrane receptor called a tyrosine kinase. Kinase are uh, enzymes that add phosphate groups. So when a receptor signals to this tyrosine kinase, phosphate groups, PO4 negative 2, are added, and those phosphate groups will cause a cellular response. We'll talk more about a particular tyrosine kinase in a bit. All right, this is just getting back to estrogen and testosterone and saying that they can go right through the phospholipid bilayer. They don't need their receptor to be in the plasma membrane. Okay, so once the signal is received, that signal has to move on to the inside of the cell. And sometimes there are intracellular pathways that carry that signal. So we're back to those tyrosine kinases we saw before. And this shows in, in particular how the ligand epidermal growth factor binds. An epidermal growth factor is gonna cause those cells to grow and divide. So if we get a cut in our skin and we want those cells to repair the cut, and it binds to a protein that's called the epidermal growth factor receptor. Okay, when that happens, we just saw that the other end of the tyrosine kinase, kinase gets phosphorylated. When it gets phosphorylated, in turn, it phosphorylates the protein called MEK, and it makes a phosphorylated form of MEK. So adding a phosphate group 
is a way to activate a protein. And that in turn passes its phosphate group onto ERK, which makes a phosphorylated ERK. And eventually at the end, you get a response from the nucleus to stimulate cell proliferation and growth cells. Okay, if this is activated at the wrong time and it goes out of control, you could get skin cancer. There's an inhibitor of this protein receptor, and the inhibitor has a name called lapatinib, and it's used to prevent skin cancers by preventing activation. Intracellular signaling by phosphorylation. So we saw in the last slide how phosphate groups are passed along. So phosphate, if you remember, is a phosphorus atom surrounded by four oxygen. And phosphate groups can be added to three different amino acid residues. They can be added to serine, threonine, and tyrosine. So this is just showing the addition of a phosphate group, which is the addition of a signal. Uh, sometimes you amplify the signal in a different way, and one second messenger that amplifies and carries the signal is called cyclic AMP, C-A-M-P, and it's a modification of ATP. You take ATP and an enzyme changes it into this form, which is called cyclic AMP. All right, this is continuing down with the um, epidermal growth protein. And so we left off the last time and we said that there was a phosphorylated ERK protein. That transfers the uh, phosphate group down to this protein and then finally down to this protein. And in the end, what it does is it takes this mRNA that has a loop and it unloops it. And when it unloops it, it allows protein synthesis to take place and that's the response. So it's a pretty uh, complex example. You don't have to know all the details, but it's this passing of the phosphate group that's changing the protein conformations. And at the end, it's this unwinding of the mRNA that's leading to protein synthesis. So here's sort of the summary of what we just talked about. So the signal was that epidermal growth factor protein the receptor was that epidermal growth factor receptor. And then there was the um, cascade of responses caused by the transfer of the phosphate group. The enzymes that catalyze transfer of phosphate groups are called kinases. And eventually that led to response. And that response was protein synthesis leading to cell division. All right, here's another exercise and read through this, and you should be able to figure out what's the signal, what's the receptor, what's the second messenger, what enzyme does intracellular signaling by phosphorylation, and what the response is. It's all right there. Okay, um, here's a development of a mouse foot, and it says, hey, these areas between the toes are killed by pre-programmed cell deaths called apoptosis. And there are messages that tell these cells, hey, you've got to kill yourself because you don't want uh, to grow in between the feet. You want a space in between the little toes. And so cell signaling pathways will sometimes cause uh, pre-programmed cell death. So very important in the correct development. All right, and finally, we see how uh, single cell organisms communicate. So these are yeast cells, and apparently there are two kinds of yeast cells. They don't call them male and female. They call them type A and type alpha. And so when a, when a type of yeast is ready to mate, it sends out a signal. And if the corresponding type, A mates with alpha, is ready to mate too, they grow towards one another and then they link onto one another. And then they combine and merge and their DNA is joined together and the cell joins together.
So it's an example of how cell signaling happens in yeast. Yeast is a eukaryotic cell. So it's the um, same kind of cell type we are. And even in bacteria, uh, there are things that are produced that give signals. So there's something called an autoinducer, and it's released and sends out a signal. So if it's a cell by itself, nothing's going to respond to that autoinducer. But if cells are close together, then they'll get responses for those autoinducers. And what kind of things will bacteria do? Well, here are bacteria that, that are growing in a catheter. So the catheter, if you're in the hospital, they put it in your um, urethra to get urine away from you. And so you don't want bacteria growing in that catheter. Uh, they're going to clog up the catheter and they're going to give you an infection. Uh, but they send out a signal to one another. They don't want the urine to wash them away. And so if they grow really heavily and they attach to the sides, then they can prevent themselves from being washed away. So those autoinducers tell other bacteria, hey, grow, and let's grow together and form a biofilm. It's a whole bunch of bacteria, and sometimes there are uh, particles with those bacteria as well. An example of a biofilm that you're familiar with is a plaque growing on your teeth that the dentist has to clean off when you go to visit the dentist. Okay. Second example, same kind of thing. It's a bacteria that lives in a symbiosis with the squid. And what makes it interesting is this bacteria is bioluminescent and it grows, it glows. And apparently when it glows, it makes the bacteria um, harder to see from certain angles. It, it changes the shading of the bacteria. And again, so they, the bacteria talk to one another to decide when to glow. All right, finally, here's an example um, of a pathway that you can try at home. Here are ordinary potato chips. Go ahead, take a bite of an ordinary potato chip, and then rinse with water, see if you still taste the potato chip. Do the same thing with nachos, and make sure your nachos have MSG, monosodium glutamate. Rinse, and then see if you still taste the chip. Okay? Okay, the results that you may get is if there's no secondary messenger, if it's just a neuron firing and going right to your brain, then when you wash away the chip, the neuron will stop firing and you won't taste it anymore. But if there's some sort of pathway, if the ligand is triggering a G protein, which is activating a pathway, those secondary messengers will still be there even once you dislodge the uh, MSG from your tongue. And until all those secondary messengers get scarfed up, you'll still taste the MSG and the Doritos will still have its flavor. So if you're a chip lover, go ahead and try it and see if you get what's on the next slide.